Mr Speaker, I commend this bill to the House. Mr. Speaker. I call Jacinda Ardern. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. It's um, my Oh, pleasure. sorry. That's the question is it the question... The motion be agreed to. Jacinda Ardern. Mr Speaker, thank you, Mr Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise and uh, give Labor's first contribu contribution in the second reading on the Vulnerable Children's Bill. We have already indicated um, our support uh, for this bill, but we do so with um, some disappointment that uh, there has been an opportunity via this bill to put on the table a wider range of measures that we believe will have had a positive or could have had a positive impact on a wider range of children. Uh, the Minister presented to the public some time ago via the Green Paper process the ability for the community, those working in uh, the, the children's workforce and beyond to share their vision and their hopes for the future for the children of New Zealand. And they did so with great enthusiasm. The response to that process uh, was enormous. And in amongst that response, because I read many of the submissions, as many as I could, given there were so, so many, many said, let's use this opportunity to say if we lift all New Zealand children and focus on general well-being, we will at the same time impact those who are particularly vulnerable. So it does give, I do have the sense that whilst this piece of legislation is heavily targeted towards um, those children who are at very high risk of abuse or neglect, our concern is that by being targeted, we potentially allow children to fall through the gaps. Uh, and that uh, it's very hard to always just isolate who those children might be, and a wider approach would have uh, lifted the boats of many and not just the few. That is and continues to be our position. We would have liked to have seen a wider children's action plan, which is what the Children's Commissioner advocated in, the, um, in his submission to this bill. And when we raised uh, with him the fact that that wasn't here and uh, did he see any signs of that coming, he, uh, he was very careful uh, in his response, but the clear submission seemed to be that given he is doing all the work at the moment around things like the child poverty monitor, that obviously he remains sceptical that that piece of work will be picked up um, by the government. I do want to focus on some of the specifics um, of the bill, though, Mr Speaker. The Minister mentioned that the child harm prevention orders have been removed from the bill. We did express concerns about those orders, but did say that we wanted to hear what the view of the public was at Select Committee. I have to say we still don't feel like we've been given a very clear explanation from the government as to why they removed those, um, because it was before the Select Committee even reported back that that announcement was made. Uh, and that has meant there's obviously a large chunk that's come out of the bill. And all of the reasons that the Minister gave around the current work that the, or, or past work the Government has done that, that she believes will cover the area that child harm prevention orders were in were actually already in motion, already either planned or in place when the child harm prevention orders were first drafted. So I still feel there could be a little more clarity as to why those have been removed. Placing on the table again, though, we always thought the threshold that needed to be met in terms of evidence base for those child harm prevention orders was very, very high because it basically said that we would be placing an order on an individual without a criminal conviction uh, having been um, met. And so uh, very sceptical about those in the first place. Checks on um, the workforce uh, that works with children was part of this bill. Uh, where there was quite a debate at Select Committee as to whether or not that needed to extend beyond the state workforce, which is what um, this bill covers, and whether or not actually the areas of vulnerability are in our volunteer workforce. And some did come forward and say, we feel like it's incumbent on us, even if the law isn't going to prescribe us, that we need to be part of this as well. But it struck us that there needed to be greater support for those volunteer agencies who feel really vulnerable, uh, that now the state is legislating um, up until a point, but they don't have the same kind of support and yet still feel obliged to carry out those checks. So there's still more work there to be done. There's also the issue of establishing protocols for reporting to SIFs having child protection policies in place. Um, it was our concern that a lot of the significant agencies, you know, health boards, um, and so on already have child protection policies. They've had them for some time. And actually those organisations where that might be new could benefit from support 
uh, in developing those policies and training. Groups like Child Matters do a fantastic job at training agencies on how to, or, or organisations on child protection policies. But now they've been told they need to do that without any of the extra support and behind and training staff appropriately. And training is key if those child protection policies are going uh, to work, Mr Speaker. I want to come to part three of the bill. This is when we get into some, some areas which I think have been a, a really contentious point for those who are working uh, in this space for, on behalf of vulnerable children. And they relate particularly to special guardianship orders. Um, I, in the time that I've worked across SIFS issues, have had numerous contact from foster carers who um, take on the incredibly important role of a foster carer uh, because of their desire to support vulnerable children. They don't get much back for doing that job except the satisfaction that they are helping a very vulnerable child. They do if they are for a time um, under the heading of a foster carer get some support from SIFS, they get some financial support as well. A lot of that though ebbs away if they move into a home for life situation. Yes there's some financial support still there but they get very little moral support. Their contact with a biological parent, which at one point as a foster carer might have been mediated by SIFS, that disappears. It's all on them from that point. Um, and that includes uh, the court processes that they have to go through because these parents, these non-biological parents who take on care and guardianship roles are frequently challenged by parents who have proven themselves to not be fit to parent, and yet they'll find themselves being dragged through the courts to do things like move town for work um, or around visitation rights. Uh, and that is extraordinarily frustrating for a foster carer, as you can imagine. Now, this bill is meant to fix that, but there have been some questions raised as to whether or not that's what it will do. And I want to read some extracts from a, a parent who would be affected by this bill. We receive no support from SIFS at all, not even moral support. We are on our own. We fight the battles alone. We have all the responsibilities and none of the rights. Really, all we want is the right to do the best we can by our little girl. But we legally cannot sign consent if she was to undergo a medical procedure that required anaesthetic. Legally, we're obliged to contact and consult with two individuals who cannot parent if they want to travel, and are supposed to do so even when we travel domestically. They are supposed to get consent to the school she goes to and where we live and could even object to the fact we go to church. Now it's been implied that this bill is going to give greater legal rights and allow less litigious situations for these parents, but the proof will be in the pudding. And there is definitely a need for that element of the bill, absolutely. And we make a commitment to review how well that is working for those parents. And if this bill does not fix the problem, we must go in again and ensure that those parents are properly supported. There's one final but really critical point I want to end on, Mr Chair. Currently in New Zealand, if you're a child in SIFS care or the state's care, the state's obligation to you as a parent ends when that child turns 17. Show me a parent who raises a child up into the age of 17 and then on their 17th birthday shows them a door and says, do not contact me again. I care little where you live, what you do, but don't come back. You wouldn't. Simply, you wouldn't if you were a decent parent. And yet that is what we do as the state. Now this bill purports to put in place support for children who are in SIFS care to the age of 20, but there's no real legal obligation they can advise on accommodation, and yet a 17-year-old uh, cannot fall under Housing New Zealand. I know of cases where children, because that's what they are, are referred to women's refuge because they have no housing for 17-year-olds. This bill does not go far enough in obliging SIFs to continue to have responsibility for those children, and we were told that in no uncertain terms by a young man who had been in the foster care system himself during his submission. Labour will oblige SIF to continue responsibility legally for these children beyond their 17th birthday. That is what a decent parent would do and that is what the state should do and we will be making moves to ensure that happens in the future, Mr Chair. I call Melissa Lee. Mr Speaker.